Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning to our friends on social media, and also those in the household. Welcome you back. And today, I'm going to go straight into the Word of God. The title of my message, Take Up the Shield of Faith, as we have been uh, uh, looking through Ephesians 6, with our team putting on the armor of God. Now, the last few weeks, we have been doing parts of the armor of God. And today we are going to look at the shield of faith. So let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 10 to 20. Remember I told you earlier, we are continuing our study this morning on the armor of God. The series has taken us through the first three pieces of the armor so far. And this morning we are looking at the fourth piece of armor the shield of faith. In the course of this series, we have seen that we have a battle to fight as believers. We are engaged in the good fight of faith. It's a spiritual warfare. And we have seen that we have an enemy to face. It's an enemy who is spiritual in nature. We are not fighting against flesh and blood. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And we have seen that we have orders to follow. We are to stand. We are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We are to clothe ourselves with the whole armor of God. The armor of God, my friends, as we have come to understand in this series, are the practical applications of the gospel to our lives. So it really has to do with our obedience, our appropriation to the gospel, to apply the gospel to our lives. And this morning, we are looking at the shield of faith, which is the fourth piece of armor. And as I've done in each one of these messages, I want to begin by just reading the full passage, verses 10 through 20 of Ephesians 6. Just so we have the whole context in mind. And we'll dig deeper into the verse 16 and look at this fourth piece of armor. Let's hear God's word. Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer of supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in the chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So once again, I just want to give a fairly simple framework for this message. And I want to, I want, we are going to look at three questions this morning. What is the shield of faith, firstly? Secondly, how does this shield protect us? And thirdly, how do we take it up? So number one, 
What is the shield of faith? A lot of times when you and I think of a shield, we may think of a buckler. We think of a small round shield. Or some of you may think of Captain America's shield, right? Those who are old enough and have seen Captain America. The shield under consideration here did not look like that. It wasn't a round shield. It was rather a rectangular shield. It was almost a door-shaped shield. Shield, two and a half feet wide and four feet long. So it was a large shield. It was large enough that a Roman soldier could crouch behind the shield so that it would cover his entire body. Now the shield was made to withstand all kinds of ammunition from their enemies as they went into battle. It was made of wood that was then covered in leather and lined around the edges with metal so that it would, wouldn't fray or it wouldn't tear apart. They would dip the shields into water before they went into battle so that when the flaming arrows and spears came at them, it would put out the flames and they would be able to deflect those missiles from enemy soldiers as they win the battle. That's the shield. So the shield really served two basic functions. It served both as their protection, which is pretty obvious, but it was also a part of the honor of the soldier. Because oftentimes on the shield, there would be emblazoned on the front of the shield, the coat of arms or the symbol for the army as they marched into battle. And it was part of the soldier's honor that he would hang onto that shield, that he would not lose it. Now, that's a story that comes from the Spartan Wars, where a Spartan mother told her son, carry your shield or be carried back on it. In other words, don't leave in the heat of battle. Don't defect. Don't run away. Don't retreat. You either stand fast with the shield or you are carried back upon that shield. In the same way for a Christian, the shield of faith, that is faith. Faith is both our protection and it's our badge. It's our badge of honor. Our faith is what identifies us as believers in Christ. And our faith is absolutely essential for our victory in the spiritual battle that we are talking about. In 1 John, the Apostle John says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So that's the shield. And it's also, and I think it's also helpful for us to just think about what faith is. What do we mean when we say faith? And I'm going to give you three aspects of faith. But before doing that, let me just say what faith is not. Because I think there's a lot of confusion about just what faith is. A lot of people, when they think about faith, they think of the phrase blind faith or a leap of faith. Maybe one of the best pop cultural illustrations of this is one of the Indiana Jones movies. I hope you remember this, those who are old enough and have seen Indiana Jones movies. In one of the movies, this is when Indiana Jones is after the Holy Grail and he's in the cave or, or this temple or something. And he comes to a place where between him and the chamber where the Holy Grail is kept. There's this vast chasm in front of him. There's no bridge. There's no way to get across. He's been given a clue. And the clue goes like this. Only with a leap from the lion's head will he prove his word. He finally decides, well, it's a leap of faith. Just a leap of faith. So he just steps out over this chasm. And when his foot comes down, he realizes there is an invisible bridge. My friends, a lot of times, that's what people think of faith. They think it's just leaping into nothing. It's a leap of faith. It's blind faith. I don't think that that's the biblical definition of faith at all. Now, it's true, of course, that scripture tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. 
And we are told in scripture that we walk by faith and not by sight. So in that sense, it's true that we don't operate in faith by looking at the things we can see with our physical eyes. But that's a far cry from blind faith. Faith in scripture is always defined by its object. And the object of faith is God himself and the promises of his word, especially his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as it is revealed in the gospel. So faith derives its strength from its object. And it's a solid object. So when we are talking about faith, we're not talking about blind faith. We are talking rather about the whole soul response of the heart of the heart to God. I say whole soul because it involves both mind, heart, the affections, and the will. Theologians and biblical scholars define it as define it with these three terms: knowledge, assent, and trust. Knowledge that corresponds with the mind. Faith knows something. Faith relies on the sure foundation of the word of God and faith knows this word, relies on this word and believes in this word. Faith also ascends to this word. That means with our hearts, we agree with it. With our hearts, we accept it. We welcome it. We receive it. Then there's trust. That's the act of the will by which we really entrust ourselves to God's truth. So all of this is involved in faith. Faith involves mind, it involves the heart and will, knowing, believing, and trusting in God's word. And the shield of faith, we exercise the shield of faith, or we take up the shield of faith when we respond with our whole souls to the truth of scripture. So how does, the second question is, so how does this shield protect us? How does the shield protect us? In some way, or in the same way in which the shield protected the Roman soldiers' entire, entire bodies. So we can also say that the shield of faith protects the whole person of the Christian. Faith is the exercise of the mind, heart, and the will. But faith is also the protection of the mind, the heart, and the will. If you want to protect your mind, you protect your mind with the shield of faith. You protect your heart with the shield of faith. You protect your affections, your desires, your conscience with the shield of faith. And you protect your will, which might, which we might think in terms of the feet, the legs, and, the, and, and move us into battle. Remember last week we looked at the readiness given by the gospel of peace and the direction and the mobility and, and the stability in our walk with Christ that is also protected by faith. In fact, the Puritans like to call attention to this, that the armor protects not only the man himself, but it protects the other pieces of the armor as well. In fact, the Puritan William Gunnell said that it is the armor for the armor. It is the grace that preserves all other graces. Now, the reason he said that is because scripture says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says that. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14. And there are many other passages that emphasize the priority of faith and the necessity of faith, and how faith is essential for every other aspect of our spiritual lives. You will never be a sincere Christian, my friends, without faith. You can't be a true Christian without faith. So the belt of truth is protected by faith. You will not be a holy Christian without faith. You remember how the Apostle Paul says in Acts 26 that we are sanctified by faith. You will never be a peaceful Christian without faith. The shoes of the readiness of the gospel of peace. Well, how is that we get peace? How do we get this readiness? How do we get this peace in mind and heart? Peace of conscience. Peace with God that we obtain through Jesus' blood. 
We get it through faith. True faith. In Romans 15, verse 13, Romans 15, verse 13, the Apostle Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. In Isaiah 26, verse 3, Isaiah 26, verse 3, the Word of God says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is straight, is stayed on you. Why? Because he trusts in you. You see, my friends, faith is essential to every other piece of the armor. Faith is essential to every other aspect of the Christian life. And of course, it's essential for salvation. We are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2 verse 8. Now, we, 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 next week we will look at the helmet of salvation. And, 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 and faith is the only appropriate respond, response to the word of God. The sword of the spirit is wielded with the hand of faith. Faith is armor of your armor. Faith is essential to the Christian life. There was a great Puritan author named Walter Marshall. Now, I might have mentioned him before. Walter Marshall was a Puritan pastor who had a sin problem. He just couldn't seem to get victory over his habitual sins. And he was really troubled by this. He was a pastor. Some of you think pastors don't struggle with sin. They do. And Walter Marshall did. So he's reading, so he's reading his other Puritan brothers. He says, these are these 17th century, you know, uh, 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 these people are in the 17th century, the Church of England, Independence, writing these practical guides to the Christian life. Water Marshall's reading them, not helping him. He just couldn't seem to get to handle on his sin problem. And finally, he went to one of his fellow pastors whom he really trusted. And he was a man named Thomas Goodwin. And he just confessed all of his sins to Thomas Goodwin. And Thomas Goodwin was a very Christ-centered man. He's one of the greatest of those Puritan theologians. So Goodwin listened to Walter Marshall's whole confession. And when he had, when he was done, he said, Brother, you have left off the worst of all sins. You didn't confess the sin of unbelief. My friends, that's what changed Walter Marshall's life. When he began to understand that the root of all of his other sin problems was a lack of faith. It was unbelief. It was a failure to believe, to really trust in Christ. And he began to do that. His life was <coughs> sorry, <coughs> absolutely changed. His life was absolutely transformed. And he preached this wonderful series of sermons, The Gospel Mystery of Sanctification, which was later published as a wonderful book. The Shield of Faith. When we talk about the Shield of Faith, faith is absolutely essential. It is essential because it protects us from the flaming darts of the evil one. That's really the focus of this passage. This is a reminder that we are engaged in spiritual conflict with a personal spiritual being who is malicious and wicked and who is evil. He is called the evil one. It's not simply you quench or extinguish the flaming darts of the wicked, generally speaking, but it's the wicked one, the evil one. So this is a description of Satan, who is the chief, the captain of all these host of spiritual forces that are arrayed against us. We are under attack. And the weapon with which the evil one and his horde attack us, the weapons are called flaming arrows or flaming darts. Now, the words that are used here could refer to a short arrow or dart that would maybe be shot from a bow. This would often be wrapped in some kind of combustible material. 
and maybe dip in a in pitch, and then they would set they would be set on fire before they would be shot in the battle. There are reports of Roman soldiers who would come through these battles and would count would count hundreds, literally hundreds, of these arrow arrows fastened onto their shield that they had caught in the battle. Now you remember I did mention last week or the week before about John Bunyan in the Pilgrim's Progress, where he talks about Christian, where he talks about Christian when he encounters Apollon, Apollon, and he says that he encounters these darts that were coming to him thick as hail, like a hailstorm of darts against him. So these flaming arrows, the word could also refer to a javelin. Or so something that's a large as a spear, a large spear that would be hurled or thrown with, with the arm. In both cases, my friends, the shield was absolutely essential to deflect the attack of these missiles, these projected darts and arrows and spears that would come through the air. The shield was absolutely essential for protecting them. There are two qualities, of course, to these darts and these arrows. They, they pierced <clears throat> and they burnt. If they pierced a vital organ, it would be a mortal wound. But even if the arrow just caught them on one side of the limb, if it was on fire, well, the soldier would burn or will burst into flames. So it was absolutely essential that they had the shield to fight these arrows. Now, what are the spiritual equivalents? Satan's arrows that comes against us. And I suppose we could say virtually all sins and temptations would be these arrows. But I think there are some in particular that would be helpful for us to consider. And I just want to suggest some examples to you. Perhaps one that many of us fight against is the flaming arrow of fear. The flaming arrow of fear. Do you ever face this? Do you ever find yourself, you are in a situation where all of a sudden you just find yourself beset with fear and anxiety? Maybe you wake up in the middle of the night and a thought comes into your mind and you find yourself in fear. Maybe you, you have had a panic attack. Maybe you find yourself in some kind of a situation where fear is just your constant companion. So how do you use the shield of faith against the flaming arrow of fear? Well, you use the promises of God in scripture and exercise faith in those promises. The psalmist says in, in Psalm 56 verse 3, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Let me give you some specific examples. When you fear the unknown circumstances of the future, you preach the word to yourself. You might use Isaiah 41 verse 10, which says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And oh, when you fear the loss of a loved one, or the loss of something which gives you a sense of security and well-being in life. And you think, how am I going to make it if I lose that person? Or if I lose my job? Or if I lose this aspect of my life? If this is taken away from me, how in the world am I going to make it? Remember the promises of Hebrews 13 verse 5, where God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Do you fear old age? When I was much younger, I never feared old age. Now that I'm middle age, I'm starting to understand how the body begins to wear down. We have got aging parents, aging relatives, and we see the effects of old age and the health problems that creep in. 
So I know what it is now to be a little bit concerned about what's going to come in the future. Do you fear old age? Here's a verse for you. Isaiah 46 verse 4. Even to your old age I am he, and to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made you and I will bear. I will carry and I will save. My friends, God promises to be with you even into old age. Do you fear death itself? Philippians 1.21, where Apostle Paul says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Listen, Christians, you don't need to fear death. In death you lose nothing that is not abundantly made up for with the presence of Jesus Christ. Immediately in the presence of God. That is gain, Paul says. Why? Because you gain Christ. Do you ever fear that your faith is so weak that you could turn your back on Christ? That you could make peace with sin? That you could die as an apostate? That you could turn away from the faith? Counsel yourself with this word. Lift up the shield of faith. Philippians 1 verse 6 says, Am I... And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the end, at the day of Jesus Christ. That is how you use the shield of faith against the flaming arrow of fear. Secondly, the flaming arrow of doubt. Do you ever doubt whether God will really forgive your sin? You have doubts that you have forgiven you have these accusations coming from the enemy. What do you do? You hold up the shield of faith and you believe the promise of 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Or in Romans 8, Romans chapter 8, verses 33 to 34, where the word of God says, Who can bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of the Father, of God, who indeed is interceding for us. I love the words from one of those great hymns from John Newton. He says, bowed down beneath a load of sin, by Satan solely pressed. By wars without the fears within, I come to thee for rest. Be thou my shield and hiding place that sheltered near thy sight. I may my fierce accuser face and tell him thou hast died. That's how you fight the accusations, my friends. The doubts that come. Am I really forgiven? Am I really saved? Do I really have assurance? Is there really no condemnation? You believe the promise of the word of God. You rely on what on that with all your soul. And you will tell the evil one that Christ has died. Maybe you're facing the flaming dart of doubt regarding God's provision. Will God really take care of my family? Will God really provide for me in this financial situation? You hold up to the promises of Philippians 4.19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And thirdly, there's the flaming arrow of despair. So we had fear, doubt, and now it's despair. Maybe there's someone here this morning who's right on the brink of it. You feel so discouraged. You feel so downcast. What do you do? Once again, you hold up the shield of faith by believing the promise of God's word. You quote the scriptures to yourselves. Psalm 42 says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for he is your salvation. Now in the pilgrim's progress, when Christian and hopeful find themselves locked up in this castle, and the castle's called Doubting Castle, right? 
in that story in Pilgrim's Progress. If you have not read the book, please go and read the book Pilgrim's Progress. The castle is owned by Giant Despair. And Giant Despair locks them up. They are in these chains. He comes to them day after day. They are locked in there for four days. He comes down into the dungeon and he's beating them with his gut gel. And he's taunting them. And he's mocking them. And he's telling them, there's no hope for you. You're never going to get out. He even suggests to them that they should kill themselves. They should commit suicide. That's what despair can feel like. But if you read the book, you will see how Christian and hopeful got out of Doubting Castle. They are there for four days until suddenly Christian remembers that in his breast, that is, is uh, in his chest pocket, he has a key, and the key is called Promise. He pulls out the key of Promise, and with the key of Promise, he's able to unlock every one of those locks, every padlock, every gate, every door, and he finds himself, his way out of Doubting Castle and away from Giant Despair. Listen, my friends, the way to fight the flaming arrow of despair is to use the shield of faith. Whatever the arrow is, whatever the temptation is, whatever the emotion, whether it's an accusation or it's a desire or it's a fear, whatever it is, the way to fight, is, fight it is with faith. And it's the only way. Faith is the victory. This is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith. So that's how it protects us. So the third question we want to look at today is how do we take it up? How then do we take up the shield of faith? How do you take up the shield of faith? I just want to give you a list of spiritual disciplines or means or ways of taking up the shield of faith. This language is slightly different. Paul does not say put on the shield of faith. He says take it up. The first three pieces of armor were to be put on. They were fastened to the body. The last three pieces of armor are not fastened to the body. They are taken up. They are held. The idea is that, is that activity, an immediate activity is involved. When you're marching into the battle, you take up the shield of faith. You're holding it on your arm so that while you're engaged in the conflict, this is in your arm, it's in your hand, and you're using it. So part of what we have to learn to do with faith is to use the faith. Use our faith, exercise our faith, apply it. So let me give you five ways of taking up the shield of faith. Firstly, hear the word of Christ. Hear the word of Christ. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, the word of God says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Word of Christ, there especially means the gospel. But it's true of scripture, the word of God, that as we hear the word of God, faith is born. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Now remember Martin Luther said, that a Christian's only organs are not eyes, but ears. That's kind of a curious way to talk. What he meant by that is that we live not by visions. Remember, Luther wasn't a mystic. We don't live by visions. We don't live by those kinds of mystical experiences. We live by the word. We hear the word. We are to receive the word by hearing. I want to tell you this morning, I think there's something specially, especially powerful about gathering with God's people, assembling with the congregation of God's people to hear the word. When we get that sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, I'm going to talk all about reading the word and how you need to read the word. You need it privately, you need it personally, you need it devotionally. Here's a plug for regular, consistent, weekly worship where we come together to hear the word. You know, when I read church history, what's amazing to me is how hungry people were for the word. Right? We know that John Calvin in Geneva preached about 15 times a month. 
There was such hunger for the word of God. There were times when Martin Lloyd-Jones in Wales, during that revival under his ministry, where he was preaching almost every day of the week, he would be preaching on weeknights, and the crowds would be such that they would open the windows because people were standing outside so that they could hear the preaching of the word. It rebukes our lack of hunger. We don't hunger for the word enough. I think if we just realize how vulnerable we are to the attacks of the evil one, how desperately we need faith, and how faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, we would have more hunger. Now, the wonderful thing today is we don't have to have services every day of the week, because you can get online and you can listen to the best preachers in the world. That's no substitute for coming to church and attending service. We need to come together. We got to listen. But on, on, on your free time, listen. Listen to be good, godly people, fathers of the faith. Listen to a John Stott or a John MacArthur or a R.C. Sproul or Chuck Swindle. Listen to them. Listen to these great preachers of the word. Fill your heart, fill your mind with the word of God. Hear the word so that your faith will be strengthened. So that's the first one. Hear the word of Christ. Secondly, pray to the in interceding Savior. Pray to the interceding Savior. I have two things in mind here. I have, first of all, your own prayer line. John Calvin called prayer the chief exercise of faith. The main way that you exercise faith, Calvin says, is to pray. And many great fathers of the faith have said this. You remember how in the letter to the Hebrews, the writer holds out Christ as our great high priest, one who is sympathetic to us, one who's tempted at every point as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, he says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find help in the time of need. Coming to the throne, praying, asking God for help. That's one of the ways of strengthening faith. My friends, Faith is the gift of God. Therefore, ask him for it. Ask him to strengthen your faith. Ask him to build your faith. Ask him to give you faith. If you don't feel like you have any faith at all, or if you feel like your faith is weak, say, Lord, strengthen it. Give me this gift of faith. But then I also just want you to note here that the person you're praying to, you're praying to and through the interceding Savior. He's not Merely your prayers that give you faith is Christ's prayers for you. You remember when Peter, he was so self-confident. Of all the disciples, he was the one who says, Lord, I will never deny you. Remember what Jesus said to him. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail the great confidence that we have as believers in Jesus Christ is that Christ, our high priest, is able to save to the utmost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for us. Pray to the interceding Savior, my friends. Look to the interceding Savior and ask him to strengthen your faith. Thirdly, Fix your hearts on unseen eternal realities. I want to encourage all of you to read Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 is a great chapter. It's called the Hall of Faith in Scripture. Remember in verse 1 of chapter 11 of Hebrews, it says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Do you remember how these patriarchs these great heroes of faith in the Old Testament, how they lived. They lived by faith. They obeyed by faith. All of you know Abraham left his family, left his country, searching for the city, the city of God, not obtaining the promise, but living by faith in the promise. He had his eyes set on eternal realities, and so it should be for us. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. 
For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparisons as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporal but the things that are unseen are eternal. One reason, my friends, we have weak faith is because we don't have an, inter an eternal mindset. We are so consumed with today's troubles rather than thinking about eternity. Fix your mind and your heart on unseen, eternal realities. Number four, lock shields with fellow soldiers. Here's one feature of the shield I haven't told you about yet. The shield of a Roman soldier had a beveled edge. They are somewhat curved in their shape and they had a beveled edge. And they were made so that they could lock together so that a battalion of soldiers, as they were marching to war, they would lock those shields together, crouch down behind them and have a formidable defense. They would have a wall against which to face their enemies. I don't know if Paul has that in mind or not, but I think the image at least is suggestive of what scripture tells us about our need for one another. We need community. We need the church. We need, we, and, and we help one another in our faith. In Romans chapter 1, Paul tells the Romans that he wants to come to visit them. He wants to come to visit them in Rome. So he says, I can impart to you some spiritual gifts so that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. He wants to be encouraged by their faith and he wants to encourage theirs. That's what spiritual gifts are for, to build up faith. Or in Hebrews 3, you have this warning. Take heed, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, which is the opposite of faith, and departing from the living God. What's the solution? But exhort one another every day, lest your hearts be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You need Christians in your life. My friends, you need brothers and sisters that you can sit with over lunch or over a cup of coffee or, or, or that you can send a text or that you can call on the phone in a moment of weakness, in a moment of vulnerability and say, pray for me that my faith will not fail. You need a small group. You need a class. You need to be engaged in community. Don't sit on the sidelines in the church. Don't be always on the margins. Get plugged in. Get involved and build real Christian friendships so that you can strengthen your faith. You can lock shields with your fellow soldiers. Then finally, here's the last thing. Look to Jesus, the great object of faith. Listen, my friends. Faith derives its strength not from itself, but from its object. And the object is Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2 says, We run the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So look to Christ. You focus on Christ. If you don't focus on Christ, you're not going to win in the battle. Charles Spurgeon says, Remember, sinner, it is not thy hold of Christ that saves thee. It is Christ. It is not like joy in Christ that saves me. It is Christ. It is not even faith in Christ, though that in uh, that is the instrument. It is Christ's blood and merit. Therefore, look not so much to thy hands, which with which thou art grasping Christ, as to Christ. Look not to thy hope, but to Christ, the source of thy hope. Look not to thy faith, but to Christ, the the, the, the author and finisher of thy faith. If thou knowest that, 10,000 devils cannot throw thee down. Look to Christ, my friends, because he is the author and the perfecter of your faith. Now, as I said earlier, I don't know where you are this morning in your spiritual life. If you are someone who feels that your faith is weak, the exhortation to you this morning is to look to Christ to strengthen your faith. And then use your faith as you exercise it in him. If you feel that you don't have faith at all, guess where you get it? 
You get it from Christ. So look to Christ. So really, my friends, the solution for all of us and the way to hold up the shield of faith for every single person this morning is simply this, to look to Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. So look to Christ this morning and in so doing, you'll hold up the shield of faith and extinguish the, all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you this morning for the gospel, for the good news that there is salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the promises of your word and how your word can strengthen our faith and nourish our faith. We want, Lord, to obey the commands of Scripture. Scripture says, build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Lord, would you help us to obey that command? Would you help us this morning to examine ourselves to see, first of all, whether we are in the faith, and then to see where we are in maturity of our faith. For every single one of us, would you help us in these moments, Father? Especially as we come together this morning. <clears throat> May Christ be the great object of our faith. May he be our heart's trust and delight. Father, we pray that we, we, we may submit ourselves to him and commit ourselves to him. May we see Jesus Christ in all the resources in all the resources we need, may we see it in Jesus Christ. May we come to a realization that we need godliness and spiritual blessings. And the sources of godliness and spiritual blessings is through Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, we pray that you minister to us in these moments. We ask all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. To our friends on social media, we thank you for joining us. We pray that you will look to Jesus this week as you journey, as you continue your journey in him. We will see you all next week. As for our friends in the household, please hold on.